Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope that this live stream finds you healthy and well. Um, this is a continuation of a program that we had done about two and a half, three weeks ago. And uh, it was interrupted by some technology issues, but nonetheless, Melissa kind of soldiered on and we had quite a stimulating conversation, but uh, we had missed out on Dana Schoff's insights. Um, and so since that time, the technology has been stabilized. We know, yeah. We hope, and uh, he will be here for the entirety of today's program or <laughs> so we're planning. Um, so uh, again, what we've, we, what we've been doing is um, bringing on some of our friends who are collectors in the field, um, featuring topics uh, from uh, mini balls um, to civil war photography. And civil war photography, of course, is the subject of today's presentation. Um, I'm Dr. James Brumall, an associate professor of history at Shepherd University, as well as the director of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. And I'm joined today by uh, two uh, dear friends um, on my screen, at least below me, uh, is uh, Dana Schof. Uh, Dana, yeah, have a wave. Hello, everybody. I'm Dana Schof. I'm the editor of Civil War Times Magazine. And I was on the uh, photography talk, and my internet just decided to not work. And uh, I got it up and running eight minutes after the broadcast ended. So, you know, technology <laughs> issues. But thanks for, uh, to Jim for having me back on. And Jim and I live fairly close together. And yesterday we had a close miss on the Antietam <laughs> battlefield, I guess. You know, I was out hiking and he was riding his bike. So, yeah, no, it was an absolutely spectacular day. Um, just beautiful blue skies. And mm -hmm. uh, I had a friend come down and we were able to enjoy the incredible resource that is Antietam National Battlefield. Um, and uh, to my side is uh, Melissa Wynn. Uh, Melissa is the director of photography for all magazines under History Net. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, we have nine history titles, uh, including two Civil War titles, Civil War Times Magazine and America's Civil War Magazine. And uh, I do a lot of the photo research and some of the photography for those, as well as uh, sort of directing the photo editors for all of the magazines that we have. So. So you're both incredibly busy, in other words. Yeah. Yes, we are busy, but we're grateful to be busy, so. We're yeah. grateful to be. This time of day, in these days, yes. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, some of our two uh, friends are, are tuning in, so welcome, uh, Rick, Melissa, and others. We deeply appreciate your time today. And so we're gonna kick it off um, with, with that uh, uh, introduction. And I, I think it will be useful, even though we have some experts in the audience, I realize, and uh, we'll be covering some slightly uh, similar terrain, but I think it is useful just once again to sort of frame the discussion by talking about the different types of photographs and giving our audiences, again, just quickly, a sense of the different sizes. Um, there's a lot of confusion when we use terms like daguerreotype, amber type, tin type, CDV. And so just a, a quick overview and um, some orientation. And throughout today's presentation, as we've been doing in the past, we'll just basically do a series of screen shares. We wanna <laughs> show you the artifacts that we all treasure so dearly and that I think really just profoundly illuminate the past. And so Dana and Melissa, again, um, from their personal collections have culled a whole series of really interesting images for today's discussion. And um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you all and, and get, give our audiences some orientation here. Well, Melissa, okay. why don't you describe the different types? I'm Hi. gonna, I'm gonna uh, screen share and bring up yeah. that little. So why don't I screen share first real quick? Oh, okay, fine, absolutely. And um, then you can show the okay. different no sizes. That'll be good. Um, okay, so if you can see this, I have some pictures of the uh, different types and of course, you know, the Civil War kind of comes, you know, in the infancy of photography. Uh, photography really comes to the United States in about 1839, um, you know, late 1830s. And uh, the first uh, image type really is a daguerreotype. You know, these are expensive. They're made on silver plated um, copper plates. And um, they could cost about $250 to $6 at the time to have made. Uh, and that's about $60, you know, in our day and age. And uh, people didn't really have a lot of uh, extra money at the time. So uh, it wasn't very accessible to uh, a, a mass number of people to get your photograph taken. 
uh, because it's the infancy of photography, the technology is just, you know, rapidly changing. So uh, these types of photography don't, they take off, but they don't stay very long, you know. So the daguerreotype stays for a few, you know, popular for a little while. And then, you know, people are continuously trying to improve upon that process. So the next one you see here is an ambrotype. Melissa, before you move on, just um, so people know that the, the daguerreotype doesn't look like that in person. They're right. sort of a ghostly image. And sometimes you have to turn the image just a certain way to see it's uh, the photograph itself. It's very unique if you haven't actually seen it in person. When you scan them, they look extraordinary like this. Yeah. And uh, But if you would hold that in your hand, you'd have to manipulate it a little bit just to get a clear view. It's uh, very reflective, yeah, yes. But, and, and I will shut up after this way you talk, but as she's going through this, notice the clarity in these images and these early photographers achieved um, just really unsurpassed clarity in some of these images, yeah. And, and I should add for those audiences who you yourself might not be a collector, just let me stress the Library of Congress does have literally thousands of images that are available and they are downloadable and they're also viewable through high res. And so what Dana, and Melissa have emphasized here is just so true. These remain just so beautiful to me, just such an incredible craft. And, and the detail is just absolutely extraordinary, just absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, it really is. They're very sharp. Uh, the focal, focal points are very sharp. And uh, these pictures actually are from the Library of Congress that I'm showing you. The one on the left here is actually a Civil War nurse. Her name is Helen Gilson. She was also the head of the Colored Hospital Service. Uh, the one on the right is a soldier and his wife, and this one is showing you an ambrotype, which again is a similar process but different chemicals, uh, and it is on glass. So they are again trying to uh, move this process to really cheaper materials uh, and um, better materials. You know, they're, they're constantly trying to improve upon the technology of having your photograph taken and again trying to make it more accessible so that it could be a profitable business for photographers. So the ambro type is on, on, on glass and uh, sometimes by the 1850s the colored glass was being used especially kind of a ruby type uh, colored glass. Uh, again that stays around for a little while and then uh, it, you know people are improving upon it the tin type comes around and this is actually uh, they're called tin types, but they're kind of misnamed. Um, it's actually an iron plate. And uh, this one is also from the Library of Congress. You can see it's a colored troop. Uh, they were coated with black lacquer, you know, to prevent it from rusting. And uh, these, of course, were much um, l less expensive to produce. Uh, they could be, uh, you know, produced easily, cheaply. And they, you can see the sizes are starting to get smaller as well. And Dana will show you a little bit about the sizes in a minute. Uh, so these were more accessible uh, to everybody, um, you know, the, a wider audience of civilians could uh, afford this. And much like the CDV, which now comes into play, the, that was uh, the technology for the CDV was invented in France in 1857. And it comes to the United States really, again, around that time and then during the Civil War, people, uh, you all of a sudden have hundreds of thousands of soldiers off to war that want to have their photographs taken. They want to send them home to their families. They want to share them with their comrades. And these are on a, um, you know, pa paper print and they're, you can see card size, they're very small. So they're easily shareable and they were sold in packs and uh, they were inexpensive. You know, so the CDV really takes off during that civil war period. And, um, Dana can show you then, I'll unshare my screen, I guess, a little bit about the sizes of the hard images. Hmm. Where is my, here we go. There's a nice slide that shows you uh, uh, the various sizes and how we start out with the largest sizes of full plate and then it descends in order to a 16th plate, all breaking down in fractions off of that full plate. And you can see on the right-hand side, the exact dimensions. Um, I, I wanna also preface what I'm gonna say here that um, compared to some collectors, what I have is a mere trifle. 
compared to some of the outstanding photographic collections I've seen uh, in, in private hands. But, you know, the photography collectors are, for the vast part, very willing to share their images with people, which is really great. Um, so I don't really have any full plates. I have a couple half plates. But really, when it comes to Civil War soldiers, uh, mostly what you see is between a ninth and a quarter plate. That's the, the most frequent sizes. And the six plate seems to be particularly popular. Um, and that may just be because it was inexpensive, but bigger, you know what I mean? Uh, it's two sizes up. Uh, so you see a lot of six plate images uh, when you're out there looking around. And if you do this for a while, you know, you start to, you know, when you could look at a case or an image, you're like, oh, you could tell what size it is. There are some deviations from these sizes, some oddball sizes, but in um, generally speaking, the vast majority of photography ranges between a 16th and a full plate from the 1850s through the Civil War period. Um, so when we say, you know, various sizes, that that is what we're going to refer to. And would you like me to sh show an image now? Yeah, be, before doing so, I just I do want to add that there's something about that sizing that would resonate with 19th century audiences because portraits in the 18th century were actually done in a very similar style. There's there's a series of different sizes that artists worked in. And so I, I just think that's interesting how how the concept of sizing sort of and pricing sort of carries across the centuries, even though the craft and the technology changes ra rather radically. So just so. that's 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 a really good point. And um yeah, that, that's an excellent point, sort of the lineage of all this, you know, the continuation of it. So I, I thought I'd start out, because um, this particular image I'm going to show serves a couple purposes, several purposes. This is a quarter plate, okay? This is a quarter plate in my collection, and I've kind of deconstructed it so people could see how these things uh, come apart, so to speak. This is a tin plate. It's a sheet iron plate. Um, that was coated with uh, photosensitive chemicals, a liquid, and then exposed, um, a, the, the lens cap was taken off and this, the soldier's image was burned onto that iron plate. And the way they put these together is that you have the, the, the plate itself, and then there's a mat, a little uh, sort of faux brass mat that was put around them and a preserver, that's a separate piece, and then they're often put in cases. This case will open up with hinges. This is thermoplastic. Uh, it's a predecessor of uh, plastic today, but it's made out of different materials. This would have been a pretty expensive image because the case is not, you know, it's not leather like a lot of them. It's this thermoplastic material. It's, it's been pressed. It's got this nice display on it. And also this image has been beautifully tinted. These images are tinted post-production. In other words, the image is taken and developed, and then the photographer or perhaps his assistant or someone in his studio would go in with paintbrushes and touch these and tint these images um, for extra money so that um, it would bring out color, certain colors. And you can see this sergeant has his vest and trousers tinted sky blue, the regulation co color for the Union Army, and he's had his Sergeant Chevron's also tinted dark blue, and he's got a veteran stripe on his sleeve. And this indicates three years service. He's also had that tinted, okay? So, and a little bit of tinning to his necktie here to kind of set it off. And cheeks, you see his cheeks are slightly rosy tinted there. So as we go through these images today, you'll see some that have certain degrees of tinting to them. Uh, most do not, but some are. And this is extremely well done. I've neglected to mention the, the gilding on his buttons and his watch chain. So, um, you know, even these little cuff buttons you can barely see have been touched up. So he's paid some good money for this. He's standing in front of what we call a painted backdrop that has a military scene. Um, these are not all that uncommon. Um, and they, you can see, you know, they're a little fanciful, right? Here's a palm tree and then rows of tents, another tree, a couple Sibley looking tents here were a tents perhaps with American flags flying from them, uh, depicting a military sort of scene, but yet somewhat fanciful um, in the background. And these, these 
painted backdrops really add more interest to the scene as well. There are no painted backdrops that are known to survive from the Civil War, which is interesting. You know, you think there must be some rolled up somewhere in some attic, or maybe we'll find one someday, but That's no it. one has uncovered one of these. Um, and if, if I find one, I will retire as the editor. Of <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, You'll and just spend your days building stone walls and, and keeping <laughs> right. them good. Right, that's exactly right. <laughs> but what's cool about some of these backdrops, and in this case, it applies, is people have identified the right. backdrop. So mm -hmm. a, a photography scholar named Adam Ox Fleischer has figured out that this backdrop was what he calls the camp distribution backdrop camp distribution and this is an article i've got in front of me that he wrote about this backdrop and because there are other images out there with this backdrop and he was able to track down that um the the uh, photographer was named uh john jones that, that took these and the neat thing is Camp distribution was established near Alexandria, Virginia, late in the war, okay? And it had three main purposes. There's, I, you know, there's a lot more I could say about it than I will say here, but it was a camp established near um, Washington that had three main purposes. One, soldiers that were on furlough were redistributed to their units by first going to camp distribution and then being sent wherever their units were. It also distributed men that were, were being transferred to the Veteran Reserve Corps. The Veteran Reserve Corps was a, a division of the Union Army where men that were not fit for frontline service were transferred out of their primary regiment or active duty regiment to a Veteran Reserve unit where they would then be assigned to guard prison camps or railroad depots or supply dumps in the rear. So the camp distribution was processing men going back to the front, men coming from the front that were damaged, or I, that's a terrible word, that were injured and that were being distributed to the Veteran Reserve Corps. And also any paroled prisoners were run through camp distribution and sent to the appropriate locations. So we know, and, and, and camp distribution had a camp photographer and this was his backdrop. So we know that I would surmise this is a union, obviously veteran, probably going back to the front from furlough, he's been home, had a veteran stripe applied, and he's probably getting transferred back um, uh, out to a, a unit, or perhaps he's been discharged too, after three years service, had this veteran stripe on, and he's heading on his way home from camp distribution. So by learning these things, and this was a fairly recent discovery, you know, you add even more depth to it. I read this article, I had never heard of camp distribution, and it adds a whole new depth to our study of the conflict. Um, before I turn it back to Melissa, I'm going to scroll through here because I mentioned the Veteran Reserve Corps. This is a carte de visite. This is one of those paper photographs that um, is not on that size chart. It was its own. Those are for hard plate images. This is the paper image. And this is a, um, uh, these were produced and cut. You know, they could take one photograph could take a number of these images and then they were cut. They were really inexpensive. This young man, is a member of the Veteran Reserve Corps, as we can tell by his distinctive sky blue jacket. And, but previously he obviously must have served in the second corps of the Army of the Potomac because he's wearing the second corps badge. And that image, that's either a red or blue badge, I would say, because of the way the colors shift. The other color is white, and that's not white. So he was either in the first or third division of the second corps, we don't know which one, but he's telling a story of his service here. You know, he's on the, in the Veteran Reserve Corps now. He's not an active frontline soldier, but he's proud of that service. And he's got his Corps badge he's kept on his cap. So we could tell, you know, a little bit, a little story of his service. And he has this really cool Sing Sing New York back, uh, back mark where this image was taken. So, um, yeah, I mean, just small details like that. You can start calling and pulling out of these images. And I'm not sure, Melissa, do you want to go to your locations or would you like me to show, oops, I moved off that. Okay. Can I, can I pause this for a second? Yeah. Um, so first, I mean, thank you, Dana, so much. And, and thank you, um, our audience here is growing. Um, and so uh, welcome to our new uh, viewers. We deeply appreciate, uh, again, your participation. Um, 
one of my former students, Cameron, coming in from Gettysburg, my mother-in-law, um, ever faithful. Thank you, Terra That's program. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I, I just want to stress what what you've done, Dana, and you can go back to the the, the image before this one. Absolutely. And I, I think audiences often have the idea that these are used for illustrative purposes only, right? These are, these are, are, are nice images to be put in a coffee table book or to be, you know, flip through um, while you're reading the text. And I think what Dana has shown us and other, other scholars that he quoted today is how you can unpack the, the many different levels of these images, not only in terms of the technologies that Melissa discussed, um, the materials. So we have a, a piece of material culture here that we can talk about. And then we can start drilling down into the image itself, understanding um, what's being represented here, the, art, the artistic display that one of our viewers, uh, David, had noted. This is a beautifully rendered image uh, yes. in the hand tinting process. The artistic display behind that hand painted um, backdrop that, that has in turn created this whole narrative tradition yes. that um, has only recently be, been discovered. And so, you know, as always, I just urge people to, to dig down below the surface and to really understand um, how complex these images are. And the two that Dan has just shown also are reflections of that status of veteranhood. These are men who have, in the, the terminology of the period, yeah. seen the elephant. They're proudly displaying that fact to the, to the audiences. Um, one was obviously disabled in service, and that forced his reassignment to the uh, Veteran Reserve Corps. And um, these are proud markers of, of, of their fight for the preservation of Union um, and uh, proud displays of their sort of martial identity. Yes, and the young man in the Veteran Reserve Corps, you know, doesn't show any signs of physical infirmity, but he didn't didn't have to be missing an arm or a leg or something. He could have been suffering from chronic disease, yep. uh, something that you know prevented him from the, the very rigorous front lines. And so he was transferred, but he still wanted to serve. So he, he moved to the Federal Reserve Corps. And, and Jim, I'm gonna just do something because I think I could tie it together here. Okay. He went, we, let's go from that really beautifully tinted image to these fairly plain images, these carte de visites, right? These are um, uh, images, you know, they're not bad, um, but they're basically seated men. Um, and, um, you know, th this is the kind of image that any reasonably good photographer could take at the time, right? There's nothing mm -hmm. too extraordinary about these. Well, I want to point out because I like material culture, this young man uh, is wearing a pinky ring, uh, which is a very common affectation, and he is as well. Um, and this young man has taken his mounted services artillery jacket and really modified it here by cutting the collar down and everything else. Uh, this fellow is identified, I can't remember his name, but he's in the, oh uh, gosh, I'm going to get this wrong, 6th New York or 9th New York Heavy Artillery. Now don't, I didn't get a chance to look at that ID this morning. Um, maybe when Melissa's screen is up, I can clarify that. But the reason I bought these is as much for the back mark. Again, stories are told to us by these beautifully uh, posed and tinted images. These fairly plain images tell us a story too. These were all taken by the same photographer. His name is Benjamin Schunk. And he operated out of Sandy Hook, Maryland. If anybody is familiar with Sandy Hook, Maryland today, you know that it is a very tiny little town along the Potomac River on the Maryland side, not far downstream from Harper's Ferry. The CNO Canal towpath goes right by it. Basically, it goes the Potomac River, the CNO Canal towpath, the railroad tracks, a road, and Sandy Hook. It's very close. Right. Sandy Hook was a tiny town before the war, and it is a tiny town now. But during the war, it exploded in population because there was a major United States hospital there. There was a large cavalry camp there. You know, it was connected to that Harper's Ferry um, sort of depot arsenal. And it was big enough that this guy came and set up a, photo a photography studio. And there's not much known about Benjamin Schunk. Uh, he's kind of a mystery. He apparently served in the Potomac Home Brigade. He was in his 50s though. So he served a couple years in the Potomac Home Brigade early in the war. Then he mustered out. The Potomac Home Brigade was an organization raised that just served locally along the Potomac River here in Frederick County, Washington County, Maryland area. 
He musters out. Um, and then he operates this photography studio. And it's not really sure that he operated one after the war. It might have been sort of a pop-up studio. You know, he, there was no studio at, at Sandy Hook before the war, I guarantee you. He went there. There's an ad in a Baltimore newspaper in which he's advertising for an assistant to help him on a foray in the country, which would assume perhaps this. Um, so, you know, photographs can solve mysteries and they can create mysteries. We don't know much about Shunk. I would love to learn more about him. It's also known he's, he took some panoramas of Harper's Ferry. Um, and I'm sure there are other images out there with his back mark, you know, but, um, you know, and a lot of these guys, I think, were in those heavy artillery regiments that were stationed there around Harper's Ferry. So, you know, it tells us about the change wrought by war, right? This town is suddenly huge. It has a photographer now. And, um, and then the war ends and it doesn't have a photographer. Right. So, you know, we could learn stories like that as well from some of these images, even if they aren't elaborate. Yes, I agree entirely. Can you go back to the, the, the frontal views of the four men? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so one of the things that's kind of popping up on the comment thread here, and again, thank you all for um, your input. And it is an interesting nuance. Almost all of those soldiers have buttoned their jackets in different ways. <laughs> and so this is something that's actually quite common. And, and I can, this is something that is relatable to the modern era. Before someone takes your photograph, unless it's supposed to be sort of an impromptu image, there's going to be a moment where you're going to pose yourself or position yourself in a certain way. You're going to do something that's going to reflect your own self-identity, um, the idiosyncrasies that make you, you. And so some soldiers, like the gentleman on the far viewer's screen, far left in the frock coat, has a very formal pose, the jacket yeah. buttoned all the way up. The figure next to him, almost a Napoleonic type uh, unbuttoning of the middle. You can almost envision yeah. thrusting his hand in there to maybe pull something out of a pocket. Right. Um, a, a certain informality to the figure on the far end, the young looking uh, soldier where only the top button's done, the rest are undone. And of course right. the earlier image you showed, the jacket itself is entirely undone. His vest is being displayed. Right. And, um, so it's something that picked up that was commented on on the comment thread. And I just wanted to sort of highlight that this does reflect personality of the individual. It does. Well, you can definitely see it in this as well because they are literally all three posed the exact yeah. same way. And you can see how they've taken little steps to differentiate themselves from, you know, everybody else and sort of cement their identity. Yeah. Right. And if you look back, you see in the background, you know, you can identify the studio, you know, the table, the drape, mm -hmm. you see this little right. fence arrangement yeah. is just barely visible right here. Yeah. Um, this gentleman here, I'm going to hazard a guess, and it's purely a guess, might be a hospital steward. Uh, because they were basically had the rank of sergeant. He does have the NCO stripe here. Right, right, right. Uh, he doesn't have the, um, oh, I can't remember the, the medical strip on there, but this is a private purchase coat, I believe, with this pocket, this outside pocket. So, you know, this guy's wearing the coat he was issued as it was. This guy's modified his all over the place. You know, he's cut the collar down, all sorts of stuff. This guy is, looks like he's bought his own coat because he didn't like the military coat. Can't really tell too much about this gentleman's coat here because of the way the image was taken. And this would have been a cheaper portrait, I believe, than these others as well. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can unshare now, Melissa, if you'd like to talk about some stuff. Yeah, and, and so as you guys are, as you all are doing that, sorry. Um, I, I, last time we, we started this program, um, there were some questions about landscapes. And um, yes. again, we're very fortunate in that um, Melissa has some really interesting views and we'll bounce back to Dan for some of his as well. And so um, of course, places are, are subjects quite prominently in Civil War era photography. And so uh, Melissa is going to offer us some um, images, uh, both from her own collection and beyond, that will uh, highlight place and, and landscape. So I'll turn it over to you, Melissa. Yeah, so I don't have a lot of uh, landscape imagery, but did somebody did ask about that last time. And uh, that is, of course, another way that photography was used at the time. Photographers were going out and they were documenting places where action had taken place. Yeah. And uh, they did that for themselves and they did that for the government as well. And they were, you know, um, sort of doing a study, but they were really documenting action, you know, where, you know, fighting had occurred or other types of engagement or actions during the war. Uh, these are 
two images from my collection. They're from Centerville, Virginia, which is actually where I live. So that's why I was immediately drawn to them. But the first one up here is a stone church. And I, what's really neat about this is that stone church is still there today. It happens to sit behind my son's orthodontist office. And <laughs> I stumbled upon it one day. I was like, oh my goodness, this is the stone church, the stone church. And uh, a lot of times when you see uh, imagery about Centerville, this is uh, kind of the most famous one. Uh, this is what's considered historic Centerville right now, but you can see there's a Union soldier here, and there was a lot of action in Centerville uh, during the war. It's close, you know, it's called Centerville because it is, you know, between several different roadways and, and major cities and close to D.C., and that's sort of how it got its name. It's in the center of that. And uh, so Centerville was pretty vital, and of course, Centerville is very close to uh, Manassas, and um, this this site of this stone church is only several miles away from the fighting at first Manassas and the Battle of Second Manassas as well. So this stone church actually was used as a field hospital for uh, during both engagements and um, the winter quarters. There was a large faction of winter quarters that the Confederates had in the area of the winter of 1861 to 62, and uh, those. Uh, winter quarters are surrounding this area here. You can actually see there's a fort back here. As oh, well. Well. And um, oh. so the in, uh, I think it's March of 1862 really is when the union kind of comes in and takes over some of this, uh, the quarters, the winter quarters. And uh, Do you know the name of the fort, Melissa? I don't remember the name of the fort. It has a name. I can't remember what it, it does. Is. It does have a name and I don't remember the name of it. Uh, there are lots of forts in this area. Again, the, the, um, the winter quarters was a massive, uh, you know, uh, amount. I mean, it was, a, it was a large area. I think there was, uh, you know, 40,000 Confederate soldiers or whatever, something like that, housed in the area around that time. And uh, again, a lot of them will fight in the first battle of Manassas. And uh, there's a lot of action that takes place around here. Uh, this second Oh, I don't know that, but the second image here is, um, this is actually, it's called the Grig Grigsby House, or more popularly known as the Four Chimney House, because it had four large chimneys, and this actually served as Johnston's headquarters uh, during that fighting, and, uh, you know, this is just another documentation, of course, in this image, there's Union soldiers on here, so, you, you know, this is a Union photographer who's come in and taken photographs of it to document where Johnston's headquarters were. Uh, another kind of, you know, neat piece of history, I think, about this house, you know, the Four Chimney House was pretty popular um, in the area. Um, honestly, I actually was out running a couple of weeks ago after I had purchased this, and I saw there was a street in, nearby named the Four Chimney House Street. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, that must be named for it, but um, so it was a very popular house in the area, and it was around uh, for decades, you know, and um, really in the, I think it was 1921 or something, where it really started to fall down in the 40s, the, you know, uh, Route 28 is kind of widened, and it's taken down. Well, some of the, uh, this is actually the first meeting place of uh, Jeb Stewart and um, John Mosby. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has a, a lot of, you know, neat Confederate history, and uh, the, some of the bricks from this building are actually used in what is now the Stuart Mosby Historical, uh, the Stuart Mosby Cavalry Museum, Civil War Cavalry Museum, which is in Centerville and actually happens to be, it was not initially, but now has been, you know, literally across the street from where this stone church is in historic Centerville. So oh. they're tied together and it's just a neat little a piece of the history of Centerville that you can get from just a couple of the images. So. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and, I, and I want to highlight here that, and I hope the audience is understanding this, and some of you already know it because there are, again, a number of experts um, in our audience, but images are serving different purposes, right? So, I mean, on the one hand, soldiers are trying to document their military service. They're trying to convey images home of their martial identity, give uh, tokens of remembrance to their loved ones. Photographers are going out into this 
um, monumental event and trying to document for public audiences, public consumption, places that are becoming immortalized in the American uh, lexicon. And, and, and so it's, it's interesting how these photographs can function on those multiple levels and are meant to be consumed by different types of audiences. And so I just want to highlight that fact. I think um, a good friend of the center, Jimmy Brooks, uh, was uh, on our other friend, John Heckman's the Tattooed Historian show a couple of weeks ago and did a really nice program on, on images and photography. And I think just had a really nice explanation of how, how many different types of audiences are, are consuming what types of images and, and yeah, absolutely. The purposes that these images have. Right, these are not images for you know individual soldiers. These are for people, the citizenry wanting, they're curious about the war and locations. Right. These images are taken and made in thousands, probably quantities and, and purchased by people to take home with them, you know? Right, they're souvenirs, they're, you know, right. basically souvenirs of the war, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, they've got, a, you know, a letter, you know, a son has said he's passed through, passed through Centerville, you know, mm -hmm. what's that town look like? And they could buy this image and right. sort of put themselves in touch a little bit with what their, with their, uh, their loved one is doing and where they've been. So it kind of mm -hmm. brings, brings things home and makes it more relevant to them. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll bounce back to Dana. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Melissa. That's uh -huh. Good stuff. Um, and um, OK, let me share screen again. Nah. I really should have this. Why is it not up? Um, I, didn't, I didn't get rid of it, honest. <laughs> um, let me just go to this then. Here we go. I, oh, I think it just defaults to that, sorry. So here's a, here's a um, let me find it here. I just added this and we're talking about, this is not really landscape, uh, so to speak, but I'll tell you the story behind this. Uh, and it really sort of encompasses a lot of different things about the civil war and about collecting. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've been interested for a long time in a soldier named John Nevin from Pennsylvania. I've edited his diary and I've given talks about him. And Nevin was a bit unusual because he served in three different units, the 28th Pennsylvania, um, and then he was captured and paroled, and then he raised independent battery H, Pennsylvania Light Artillery, which is the subject of this photograph. But, He's not commander of that organization very long when he gets in trouble with his, his commander, Brigadier General William F. Barry, and he's forced to resign from the military. Uh, Nevin will go on and become the major of the 93rd Pennsylvania and lead the regiment actually at Gettysburg and some of the other campaigns in 64. So actually there was a photo show this past March right before the pandemic hit and my wife and I were driving down and Melissa was there already and she calls me and she says, this dealer has these Camp Nevin images, Camp Nevin. And I'm like, really? Yeah, independent battery. <laughs> image. And I'm like, whoa, that's John Nevin's battery, right? So I went down there and he had three of them. This is one of the three. And I've, there was a series of 10 images taken of this artillery battery. Now, by the time these images are taken, Nevin is gone, okay? He's no longer in service uh, with the battery. He's actually in the 93rd Pennsylvania. Um, but this was obviously his battery. And there's they're really extraordinary photographs I've shared in other formats. Um, I don't know who the photographer was. I don't know the story behind it. I don't know if this was a battery raised in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. I don't know if someone came down from Pittsburgh to document it. These are large format albumens. This is sort of a eight by 10-ish kind of image. This is another type of photograph. Mm -hmm. Same process as a carte de visite. It's taken on paper. It's just larger. The, the writing here, this is all done by hand. This is all calligraphy done by hand, hmm. by pen and ink. It's extraordinary. And so I love these images because even though Nevin's not there, this is part of his history, this battery never sees service, uh, which is, uh, it tells you again about sort of the resources of the North that right. they can put together a massive uh, six guns, a six gun Napoleon cannon battery and afford never to engage it. It always stayed in the defenses of Washington, basically guarding roads 
close in against Mosby and Raiders incursions. You know, I don't think they ever fired a shot in anger, honestly. Um, but, you know, it's amazing. You know, you look at this and you see the remuda of horses and the Sibley tents and these well-equipped artillerymen drilling. The cool thing about this is I got this. I didn't know where Camp Nevin, Virginia was. I knew it had to be around D.C. somewhere. You know, I figured that's where they served. And so um, I put this up on a Facebook uh, group called Civil War Faces, actually, if you're interested in people put their photographs up there. And uh, an old friend of mine from my living history days, I still, well, I shouldn't say I'm done with that, but you know, when I used to do it more often, named Bill Lawson, got intrigued by these photographs and he started doing his own research and he didn't even tell me. And he eventually he put these things, his research up in the comment section and he identified some of the, the uh, structures on the horizon here by finding an Alfred Wode sketch of the very same view, different soldiers on this ground. They were infantrymen, but the, the caption said um, something about soldiers near Fort Ellsworth, Virginia. And Fort Ellsworth uh, was in Alexandria. And then Bill identified this sort of smokestack looking thing mm -hmm. in this building with the cupola that is the Mount Vernon Cotton Company in Alexandria, Virginia. It's the same building you see in the sketch of Wode. Mm -hmm. And he found that image, he found that building in another image. That's, it still stands in Alexandria, the building. And you can't really see it, but just out of focus here is what is a steeple. That's probably the steeple of Christ Church in Alexandria. Hmm. So almost by crowdsourcing this image, right? We, we identified, where's Camp Nevin? The people that owned this that I bought it from and other collectors I bought, they didn't know where Camp Nevin was. You know, it probably was just a colloquial name. It might not have been an official part of the army nomenclature. You know what I mean? Right. It's just these guys. And the other story it tells us is, even though their, their, their guy that raised the battery had kind of left under a cloud, they were honoring him by the naming this camp after him. So they still you know, we're kind of giving him some props, if you will, and support for what he had done by raising this battery and still naming it after him. Um, and so all those stories, you know, come out of this. And when you share these images, this is the kind of stuff that can happen. And um, it, it was really fascinating to see all the stuff that Bill put together, Bill Lawson put together to identify this location. It was incredibly detailed research. And I mean, you have to wonder how many images yeah. went through to find the, these, you know, very, they're difficult to see, you know, structures yeah. on the horizon there and they matched absolutely perfectly. And so basically this camp was behind the fort line, you know what I mean? In that protected right. line, right. And the closest fort to it was, was Ellsworth, yeah. No, I mean, it, it is incredible. I think it just emphasizes too that, you know, there's a very passionate community Yes. Uh, and I, I don't like the word amateur historians. I mean, I think we're all public historians in some sense, but there's this, this vibrant community of, we'll just say public historians with different levels of interest and in education um, and uh, jobs. But I think in many cases, when you bring a lot of people together, really intriguing insights can be brought to bear right. that otherwise would be sort of lost in the vacuum. And so, yeah, and I'm, for, I'm, I'm forever grateful to him for just taking yeah. an interest in this. And uh, he's from Alexandria. He's interested in the Civil War and Alexandria history his whole life, and he used that knowledge to, to kind of tie this together, which is just really good. And I, I think, too, just for viewers, um, what's going on in the image itself, of course, um, is a series of artillery crews positioned where they would be as though the batteries were firing. And so there's a yeah. whole other kind of narrative about that. Right. So a section is two guns of a six-gun battery. Okay. And each section had its own commander. So a captain commands the battery. Each two guns has its own commander. And they are lieutenants. And this one actually, this is the lieutenant here. His mm -hmm. name is uh, Theodore Finley. And he was, uh, I believe, a cousin of John Nevin that founded the battery. But this is yeah. Lieutenant Finley standing here in the middle of his section. And he's identified here on this uh, uh, image directly. Okay. okay. So that's, that's kind of neat. Yeah. Okay. So 
I don't know. You want to take a question? I, I was going to hop to something really not related to landscape, if that was okay. Yeah, let's hop to bring it kind of home. And maybe do you have one more image grouping that we can do? And then we'll sort of wrap well, up. Well, I will, I will do a grouping. Can I do my Fredericksburg story? Yeah, sure. Okay. So my ancestors, I had two relatives that served in the 134th Pennsylvania Infantry, a nine-month regiment. And there's not a lot of documentation or material culture out there related to this regiment that was only in there for nine months. And the study of the story of the nine month regiments is another story all to itself. But I am a thrilled to own this particular image. This is a 1906, August 16th, 1906 image mm -hmm. of a reunion of the 134th Pennsylvania Infantry in Cascade Park, I believe, in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, my hometown. Hmm. My great grandfather's name, George Washington. He was, uh, they were, George Washington and his brother, Baz Leal, served in Company A of the 134th Pennsylvania. Baz Leal does not make it home. He's mortally wounded at Fredericksburg, which was one of the major engagements for this regiment. George Washington, my great grandfather, does come home. And this is him right here, sort of oh, wow. peeking around this gentleman. And I, blew him up because this is my great grandfather, George Washington. Okay. This is a picture of him that a copy of a photograph that I own. Huh. And this is a copy I have as well. These are post-war pictures, but this is George Washington. I just absolutely love this picture of him with his horse. Yeah. But that's obviously the same man. So that's my great grandfather. And this is a close up of the best view I could get of the reunion badge uh, that they're wearing, yeah. which they were in the fifth corps. So you could see the Maltese cross. Sure. So, you know, this is a fantastic image in itself for me to have. And I, but I recently acquired from another collector, I'm gonna mention his name, Chuck Joyce, very nice guy, who found out I was interested in this regiment and he sold me this stereo view. This is another format we haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. This is another type of image on paper. This is a post-war image, okay? But when you slid this in a special viewer, it became like 3D. Okay, and they're very graphic. And a lot of the images that you see that were taken by Gardner of dead soldiers on the battlefield, if you view those in stereo format, it's appalling because you can see open wounds in some cases. It's really different to look at them like this. But this uh, stereo view shows a portion of the Fredericksburg battlefield. Okay, this is the Stratton house right here. And this is a corner of an outbuilding of the Ebert house. This stone wall, if you kept following this stone wall up and it would curve, that's the notorious stone wall at the foot of Mary's Heights. This is an extension of it that ran in the town, okay? The 134th Pennsylvania literally charged that stone wall in the last attack of the day. Humphrey's division charged right on the other side of this stone wall, going from, I'm not, well, just this is the way they would be attacking, okay? toward the stone wall. So I got this and I'm looking at the ground over which my great grandfather attacked and my great uncle was mortally wounded by a, a you know, shell or a bullet, We're not, I'm not sure which. It literally took my breath away when I saw this because of course this area is all built up. The Stratton house still stands, but it's radically different now in the plain before the stone wall to get this view. And on the back of the stereo view to make it even more compelling is this uh, documentation, someone has written, Stonewall looking towards fairgrounds, noted at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Now the fairgrounds were kind of next to the Stratton House in this area right here, right. okay? And then below it, uh, uh, who, someone who is obviously a veteran has written in pencil, this is to the right from where we lay. Hmm. The wounded who crawled to this large brick house, beggar all description, so I was told. Hmm. So he, they, and actually, so the front of the house is to the left. And of course, this is the safe side, as you will, if these guys are charging. Mm -hmm. And this is where all these wounded guys crawled to try to avoid being killed, you know, during this attack. And then lastly, I, you know, you know, then, you, then you go and you read uh, books about these battles. And this is Frank O'Reilly's book about the Battle of Fredericksburg. I can't remember the title. It's a great book about the battle. This Winter, is a map. Winter War in the Rappahannock. That's right. Winter War in the Rappahannock. Great book. 
This is a map showing that attack. There were two brigades of Humphrey's division, uh, and I want to get too many names thrown out here. Peter Allabach uh, led the attack, and my ancestors were in the brigade that followed them, and you can see the 134th PA was the right front regiment here as they're moving. You can just make out the word Stratton here. The right. Stratton house is hidden by this block, and the Ebert house is hidden. But if you see, here's the stone wall defended by the Confederates, and here's where it curves down, and that's the photograph. That's what that's the part of the stone wall you see in the photograph, this section right here, as it curves down toward the town. And you can see how the 134th PA is going to race right across between the Stratton House and that stone wall as they attack the sunken road and face that storm of Confederate gunfire. And of course, there's the fairgrounds that's mentioned in that, that stereo view. So, you know, you could put these interesting stories together with these images that, you know, this really kind of connects me to my ancestors' experience here. Uh, and it makes it even more meaningful to me uh, as, as I study and learn more about this battle and, and what they went through, you know. Um, and so lastly, this is actually a soldier of the 134th Pennsylvania. I don't want to say lastly, this is Robert Carruthers. And you see, this is another military painted backdrop. Right. And so on the back here, it says at Arlington Heights, Virginia, this image was taken in August 1862. And even though it's not my ancestor, I kind of connect to this because that was the first place the 134th was sent, Arlington Heights, Virginia. And now, you know, if I see other images like this, even if they're not identified with this back, the backdrop, you know, this is the Arlington Heights backdrop. And um, I don't know how much you want to, I'll tell you, you know, this is a cool image. Um, and again, how images can tell us stories. I bought this image because it was a soldier in the 134th and you don't see those a lot. And what's really neat is the documentation that came with it is this old card, filing card, dated January 5th, 1880. And in the post-war years, and I'm going to show you one other thing after this, and I'll shut up and I keep saying that, but I am. Uh, in the post-war years, a lot of people would take these images and turn them into paintings. And you sometimes see these in antique shops. You know, these look like it's obvious it looks like a photograph that's been painted. These are the instructions for doing that to this Im image. This is a quarter plate tintype. So someone has written on here instructions to paint Robert Carruthers. Hair, dark brown. Eyes, light blue. Complexion, very light. Full figure as is shown in small picture. In other words, paint him full figure, okay? These might be the photographer writing down what the, what the family wants. Um, clothes blue, it says here. And then, oh shoot, I do that. Someone else wrote in pencil, Robert Carruthers, 134th Regiment, PA Volunteers, in this picture taken 1862 August at Arlington Heights, Virginia. So somebody in 1880, well after the war, and I have, of course, everything's closed with the pandemic. So I haven't gotten to search his service record yet to see if, if he was, uh, dead at that by that time or you know his pension file he has a pension file but i haven't figured out what's in it yet um but someone wanted to commemorate his service what 15 years after the war right and keep his memory alive on the, on the wall of their house so they took this image and gave it to a, a, a studio to have it reproduced in a larger color format which is really interesting and talks yeah. about you know memory and commemoration as well right yeah no, absolutely Absolutely. And then the last thing, I just got this, and I think that, um, oh, let me scroll here, thing, that uh, the viewers might find this interesting. Another little twist on these images. This looks like a fairly simple, plain image. Not a lot going on here, perhaps. However, you can see this slight line, okay, up here. That tells us a little bit of a story. And this belt buckle tells us a little bit of a story. And this revenue stamp is going to tell us a story with this back mark. This belt buckle is unique. There was a photographer in Pennsylvania <clears throat> that actually had a, a, a belt buckle carved out of wood. Because in some of these images, the, um, the photograph is reversed, the way the process works. The image strikes the plate reversed to what it is in reality. 
So if you see, when you look at Civil War images, a lot of times you'll see the belt plate is upside down or reversed. It'll say SU, right? So this photographer got around that by having a uh, belt plate carved out of wood in reverse and painted gold. So that when it was photographed, it appeared correct. So this was a photographer's prop and that you can look, Jim, you know, Civil War belts. You see how that belt's a little funky, a little wide? Mm -hmm. That's not your standard issue belt, right? So he must have had this thing made on a special belt that these guys would put on. Maybe it's even attaches in the back somehow, right? Yeah. So that their belt plate looks like it says US because if you look at the buttons, we would consider that buttoning like a female garment today. They are not buttoned, you know, the right way, like, a, like a, the standard frock coat, you know? If yeah, you follow. And, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think, again, it's that, that projection um, of, of the martial identity and the addition of props and backdrops, all that's conveying the soldier's identity to the viewer. Yes. And in this instance, the photographer has gone to pretty great lengths right. to ensure a proper reading of that very important U.S. Uh, buckle uh, on the on the waist of the, the soldier. Right. And so he didn't like the fact that it kept coming out reverse, so he right. had the prop made. And this basically, this CDV, this is a CDV. This is a photograph of a photograph because originally this was a tintype in a case, I'm gonna show you this, kind of like this. So what you're seeing is the edge of the mat, okay? So this soldier had a tintype taken in Pennsylvania somewhere in a case like I just showed you. And when he got home to New York, to this photographer, he had that photographer take a photograph of his tintype so that he could have multiple copies of the image to give to people. And we know he did that right after the war because this revenue stamp is dated 1866. Mm. And these revenue stamps were applied between August of 64 and August of 66, I think, right, mm -hmm. Melissa? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was, it was revenue. You had to pay a tax on it. And mm -hmm. so uh, it was for the war effort to raise money. And so um, we know when this image was taken and it's after the war and this guy is home and he's probably, you know, hopefully survived or maybe he didn't survive. We don't know, you know, maybe a relative wanted this to cut up to give to a bunch of people because he's no longer around or maybe he survived and he wanted to give it to his brothers and sisters and who knows, right? right? So we don't know the end of the story, but this simple CDV tells us more than we might think at first blush. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, and with that, you know, I always make my, make the call and I'll just <laughs> say it again, you know, I really would encourage audiences to think deeply about different types of evidence. And, you know, I, I have become very invested in material culture um, as, as a really important medium. And I think on the one hand, you both are collectors and enjoy the ph photographs for what they are. But on the other hand, you've been able to sort of dig so much deeper into them and then show how many different historical layers they can reveal. And so, you know, audiences, again, I would encourage you to visit websites like the Library of Congress, which has an incredible um, array of these, these contemporary images. And um, again, just a very uh, sincere thanks to both Melissa and Dana who have taken time out of their busy schedules and then shared with us today um, special uh, uh, pieces of their, uh, their collections. And so- and, and thank you to my internet for working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Stay on, <laughs> yay. <laughs> I wasn't sure what we were gonna do this time, Dana. I was gonna have to- I, uh, I was a little worried too. I went yeah. through most of my collection last time, so. <laughs> it's one o'clock, it's one o'clock. We're at the safe zone, we've made it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, with that, uh, any final words, Melissa or Dana? I'd just like to say that, you know, um, People ask, well, they're so expensive. You know, you can still go to shows and get an unidentified carte de visite, sometimes 50 to $75, uh, if you're interested in collecting this stuff. Um, and um, I, I just think that if, as people interested in the Civil War, we're incredibly fortunate that this medium existed to, relieve, to, to, to leave us with this, this amazing, rich record that you can get so many stories out of these images. Um, that we could almost keep digging and digging forever and find out more and more about this conflict because of the photo photographic record. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I would say, I think again, like the Camp Nevin 
uh, information is a perfect example of why the photography is so important to continue to study and and collect and share and crowdsourcing, you know, I mean, a couple of weeks, you know, four hours before Dana put that up on Facebook, nobody knew where Camp Nevin was. And four hours later, you know, where Camp Nevin was, you know, 160 whatever years later, you know, and it's, that's incredible. We're still learning about the Civil War and there's lots of pieces to find in the, the photographs, you know, the stamps are neat to date. Uh, the, you know, the stamps, the backdrops. Once you start to really get into photography, the Civil War photography, there's lots of little clues and um, to be able to pick out, you know, new pieces of information about some of these images. And they just continue to teach us about the war. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so on that hopeful message, um, I think we'll, we'll end the program. So thank uh, you all, the audience. I deeply appreciate your time as always. Again, thank I hope you for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in, yes. Yeah, I hope this message finds everyone healthy, selfie, healthy, mm -hmm. <laughs> safe, and well. Um, so with that, have a wonderful uh, week. We'll have a program this Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. Dr. Angela Elder and Dr. Allison Fredette will be joining us for a discussion about uh, marriage and mourning rituals uh, during the antebellum Civil War and Reconstruction eras. Um, Allison has a great book that just came out and Angela will have a very good book that will be coming out probably through the University of North Carolina Press. And so um, keep tuning in to our program. We deeply appreciate your support. And with that, I will wish everyone to be well. So thank you. Thank you.